Hello, everyone, and welcome to Facebook Live with the Horticulturists. We are the Horticulturists here to ask, answer your gardening questions and talk about gardening topics. My name is Candace Hart. I'm the Illinois uh, State Master Gardener Specialist for Illinois Extension, and my specialty tends to be flowers of any kind, so annuals, perennials, landscaping. Cut flowers, so I love to answer questions on those kind of topics. Uh, we are going to focus on gardening with kids today and kids' activities, but we're also going to answer your gardening questions. So if you have questions, add them to the comment box, and we're going to answer those as we go through today. But I also have two other great horticulturists on with me today. So Kelly and Ryan, you want to introduce yourself? Whichever one wants to go first. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll lead us off. Uh, my name is Ryan Pancall, horticulture educator out of Champaign. And, um, you know, my specialty area is trees and shrubs, uh, forestry and arboriculture. That's the stuff that I have uh, spent most of my career working on. But also like native plants, right along with all that other stuff. And also a big vegetable gardener like Kelly. So I like to talk about vegetables, grow a lot, eat those, and, and, and talk about all those kind of things. So then I'm, I'll hand it to you, Kelly. Awesome. Okay. Hi, everyone. I am Kelly Alsop, and I am a extension educator on horticulture for based out of Bloomington. And my specialty is integrated pest management. And despite my specialty being that I kill insects, I actually love insects. And I love talking about um, pollinators and beneficial insects. And I even like talking about invasive insects, even though they're bad. It's an interesting topic. And then I love doing some vegetable gardening in um, my big old tree pots. So uh, uh, that's what I've been doing lately. And um, yeah, I actually, when I first started this job, I um, had, there was a huge demand on my time for children. And I really didn't know exactly what I wanted to do with kids, but I started teaching them um, how to like insects. And uh, uh, it was surprising at first because everybody was afraid. And I said, okay, my evaluation is gonna be just to get them to like them a little bit more. So I started going into classrooms and I started taking my pet insects with me. And uh, let me tell you, I am very popular amongst the fourth graders with my live insect circus. And uh, I took it to the fair. And so uh, now I always have some kind of live insect in order to do a really quick program for kids. You don't have to be too complicated. Um, I do have one I wanted to show you that um, um, I have been grow uh, growing him. <laughs> <laughs> He's not a plant. <laughs> I have been raising him for about eight months now. He is a ghost mantid, and he actually came to me. He looked like a little ant, and I fed him little tiny fruit flies, and he has molted three times, mm -hmm. and now he has wings, and now I catch house flies on my front porch to feed him. Um, super interesting. I love the camouflage effect. And I know my camera is not as giving him justice for his beauty, but um, he's, he was, he's been really easy to raise. All I really had to do was I got this glass jar and um, I just have an aspirator right here notice the bottom of it is gone that's because asher took off with it somewhere and i can't find it anywhere <laughs> but uh in in the beginning i sucked up insects for them through this now i just catch flies in a baby jar <laughs> and it's surprisingly easy to catch flies and feed them yeah so there's all these websites online about pet insects you know, they usually rate them on how easy they are to take care of. I always choose the easy ones because I am not a professional insect, per, uh, professional uh, what, you know, I, I don't have the perfect environment. So I know I'm moving away from the screen, but I'm trying to bring my next one. This is a blue death feeding beetle. Oh, <laughs> you painted. 
<laughs> and what he does is he pretends to be dead. That's because he's from the Southeast. And um, that's how he defends himself. He just pretends to be dead because, you know, no bird wants to eat a dead insect. Mm -hmm. What's really cool about him, too, he's blue because of the bloom that is on him. And what is bloom on an insect? It is kind of a built-in sunscreen for him. And so I love using him because I get definitely get to teach about insects adapting to the world. So it's very sunny and uh, the southeastern part of the United States. Southwestern, I always mess that up. Southwestern, excuse me. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, again, I still teach a lot of insects. So, Candice, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen right now. Mm -hmm. And those. Okay. And while you're doing that, if anybody has questions, start adding those to the comment box. And we're going to get to those in between our... I was so prepared and now I'm... Let me come back to this, Candace, please. Okay. You want to uh, move on so, to the question? Yeah. So we can, uh, uh, we can take a question and I'll uh, set this up and we can... I can show you a few more things that I do with kids that okay. really easy to do. You don't have to be a professional entomologist to do it. And the kids love it. Perfect. Okay. Well, we'll get back to some insect talk, but I know we've had at least two questions come in so far. Um, Greg had a question. Are all spider warts invasive? So I know I've had spider wart in my landscape before. It's a native, um, I think it's a native plant. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily classify it as invasive. I would probably call it more aggressive maybe. Um, but I know I've had just the straight species in my landscape and it has been aggressive. Um, has anybody else, have you, anybody else had other experiences with spider warts? Um, I agree that they're re aggressive, but uh, I think they're pretty cool. I think it's a pretty, it's a pretty plant with those purple uh, purple flowers. So I think if you have the space and you just kind of know ahead of time that this is going to fill an area, it's going to spread. Uh, then I think it's a nice plant to grow. But if you expect it to kind of stay in a, in an, its own little clump, then it may not be the best the best choice for for your landscape. You yeah, guys concur. it's kind of nice to have things from time to time that fill space and outcompete weeds. I mean, I know I've started some new areas uh, lately since, you know, since we moved to our current house in 2017, and I'm kind of happy for those black-eyed Susans and things that are, you know, kind of taking over. We've got a bee balm that's just going nuts, and hey, that's a spot that I don't have to weed right now while all those plants mature. I know, you know, down the line that can get to be annoying when it's, you know, spreading into other things, but... Uh, you know, there's a time and a place for that. So maybe when you start your next new garden, that's the first thing you add to kind of fill some space and, and you know, out compete the weeds and keep them out for a little bit. So. Yep, exactly. Yeah, those kinds of those kinds of plants are perfect for a bigger garden. You know, a smaller garden, mm -hmm. I would never plant spider wart, but you want to fill in some space, it's awesome. Let it go. Yep. Great question, Greg. Greg also had a question, a veggie question here. He said, uh, my cucumber plants are growing, but I don't have any blossoms yet. Should I be concerned they're in full sun? I know this is a common question we get many summers. So what would you guys say to that? Um, what was the plant again? The cucumber with no blossoms oh. yet. Um, well, um, it depends how late he planted them. I mean, maybe they're just not ready to blossom yet. Um Usually when vegetables do not flower, it's because they're not uh, receiving enough sun. And you can try and try and try, and it'll still never work. Um, <laughs> from the girl who is trying to put tomato plants in every corner of her property, knowing she doesn't have the full eight hours of sun requirement. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know just just to report on my cucumber plants, I, I got some starts in uh, pretty early. And, you know, actually in central Illinois, here, there was a late frost really zapped them. I mean, killed a couple, uh, but I have some that survived that, but it's got, it really set them back. It hurt them. Um, so really, I'm, I've only been getting uh, 
mine for about the last week or so. And, you know, I put those in early, you know, maybe bef definitely before May 1st. I don't have it written on the calendar. So, you know, if you had them in real early, maybe they suffered a little bit from that cold. Um, you know, Kelly's absolutely right. Sun is the other thing that I usually think of. If it was, you know, some kind of nutrient deficiency or something, I think we'd see off-colored leaves and things. Um, you know, honestly, the biggest management challenge for me with uh, cucumbers is the cucumber beetle. And I don't know how you guys have handled that, but um, I've tried to do it with exclosure, you know, floating row covers mm -hmm. up to the point where those things start to flower because then you have to let pollinators in. So you can't keep the cucumber beetles out. You have to let the pollinators in. Um, and so then to me, it's just a race between the cucumber beetles, the virus spread, and uh, hopefully some fruit production before my plants start to look terrible, but I do pay pretty close attention usually to when they flower because I've got to pull those row covers off. So, I mean, I can tell you that was just maybe last week on mine. So, you know, maybe you're not too far behind the game as long as it's looking a healthy green color and you've got, you know, vegetative growth, you can see, you know, some, some vining spreading growth. Um, I think you might be fine still at this point in the season. So. Yeah, and even though we had some rain last weekend, uh, I don't know about you guys, but I'm watering like crazy. Me too. Yeah. You know, with these high temperatures and no water and, uh, and windiness. The last three weeks, my watering game just went up. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm watering these pots every day, sometimes every other day. Um, I try to let them dry down a little bit, but then I come out and they'll be wilted. So uh, uh, drought can also affect, you know, make the flowers abort in times. Yeah, and I'm, I'm doing okay in places where I did some really heavy straw mulching. Like I don't like to have any, you know, soil splash up on my tomato plants. So, I mean, I do, you know, thick layers of straw. If you can kind mm -hmm. of peel it off the bale and mats, Lay it out. So like those areas, I can definitely tell, you know, I can reach down in and feel where my tomato plants are still, you know, have a little moisture this week. So that was probably not the side of the garden that I was focusing watering on, but where I have some potato hills, you know, that are just kind of their soil, um, kind of like your pots, Kelly, those are up a little bit and man, those are drying out super fast. So that's where I'm kind of fo focusing it um, for me anyway in watering effort. So sometimes it kind of depends on, at least for me, different areas of my garden, how well I've mulched, how well I didn't. <laughs> Potatoes, I didn't get any mulch on. I'm just kind of been hoeing those and uh, keeping them clear of weeds and pulling stuff. So um, yeah, kind of very, I've got half of my garden that doesn't need water that much and half that really does. So. Sure. Right. Candace, what, what flower are you growing that is the one that tells you that everything needs water? Oh man, probably my dahlias. I have a couple raised beds of dahlias that you can really tell when they're hurting for, for water. That's usually my, my bed that shows it first. Yeah. Indeed. We all have these indicator plants. I'm sure you guys do too, have these indicator plants. You go out there and like, you know, my hydrangea is in my front bed is one of my indicator plants. If mm -hmm. it's not looking happy, probably everything needs water. Yep. Turn on the water. <laughs> okay. We've got some other questions. Kelly, do you want to show your, your insect photos? I can. Those? I can. I yep. can. I found that. And so uh, if you're just... If you're just joining us, Kelly was showing us some live insects earlier that she uses for kids' activities, and now she's got some um, photos as well. Yeah, um, so uh, this is what I have learned over the last eight years of working with kids, um, uh, with particularly with insects. So one thing is you pull out the magnifying glasses, and they go crazy. <laughs> and you just give them a magnifying glass and you tell them to go into the garden and go scout, or you can actually catch some insects and uh, have them look at those insects with that magnifying glass. I have been able to keep multiple children entertained for long periods of time with these uh, magnifying glasses. So it's a great I, I love the little... I love the little nose pressed up against the magnifying glass. That's just hilarious. That's my niece, and her mommy is a scientist, and we said, well, we've got to let teach her how to <laughs> properly use the magnifying glass, but what an adorable picture. Uh -huh. And another thing is, is uh, the niece, again, is in the middle, 
Uh, these are Madagascar hissing cockroaches. You can order them off of uh, internet, no problem. They're very easy to take care of. They hiss when you touch them. Uh, again, that's my niece in the middle. And then I've also had Eastern Lubber grasshoppers that I borrow from the University of Illinois that have been extremely popular with the kids. Um, every time I have a live insect, these are my educational goals. I talk about the three body regions and the compound eyes, and I'll drop the insect on the ground and say, why did it not hurt itself from the big drop? And then we'll talk about the exoskeleton. So it's always my way. What do they eat? Um, you know, how many legs do they have? Um, why are they colorful? Um, so it's always my way to get them to, when I ask them questions about the insects, this is my educational goal is to get them to know a little bit more about insects. Um, I love raising caterpillars with kids. Um, it really teaches them life cycle, a way for them to understand how these insects transform. I know that uh, Candace and Ryan know, but sometimes it can be very difficult for me to identify insects because insects, you know, uh, go through different life stages. And, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, a monarch caterpillar looks very different from a monarch and adult and why and how are they different? So the kids really, really get into this. Um, we do it with monarchs. Actually, raising your own monarchs is very beneficial because nine out of 10 monarch caterpillars um, are become susceptible to the environment. I love the black swallowtails. It's on dill or um, parsley. And you, you go up there and you poke that uh, caterpillar because, you know, everybody goes around poking caterpillars. <laughs> And they will send out a uh, yellow scented, uh, yellow scented, yellow, really uh, uh, not great scented uh, forked gland. And it's just, it's that's the way that that caterpillar defends itself. And it does smell pretty bad, but man, I can get the kids going when I start poking the caterpillars. <laughs> Um, another thing that I've done in the past is build insect hotels. Um, I don't really know, um, you know, in my research of this, I haven't found like tons of really, really good information on how these really do uh, uh, provide a habitat for insects. But, uh, you know, we just like take the concept, you know, they overwinter in leaves and the... Uh, upturned flower pots with the straw stuck in them, a queen bumblebee may or may not overwinter there. Um, but just from my personal observations, you know, this is great for things like spiders and bees. Um, they, the bees definitely use um, those um, uh, bamboo sticks and the straw, uh, I mean, excuse me, the drilled holes. Um, you know, this is the year of the cicada. Uh, we know that the 13-year and the 17-year cicadas are going to come out this year. And uh, uh, Sarah Hewson told us that that was four years earlier than normal. So um, what uh, anybody, Ryan, Candace, do you remember as a kid being chased around uh, with one of these thinking it was scary, right? Mm -hmm. Well, why not? Paint them and put glitter on them. I'm <laughs> just not? saying. Why not? I mean, we're going to find these everywhere this year. And it be, can be a kind of a cool thing to, you know, a little arts and craft with insects. And then here, this is a, a cicada being uh, uh, parasitized by a cicada killer. And this is a great big pollinating wasp. Everybody's scared of them. Um, usually it's the males that approach you and they can't sting you. Only the females can sting because the females are the ones that are required to paralyze that cicada, take them to her underground nest, lay an egg on it, and there's food for the larva. So so that's not a murder hornet then? <laughs> that is not a murder hornet. I think it's hornet. a lookalike though. 
Um, you would not believe how many people will bring a cicada killer to me and ask me what it is. Uh -huh. And they're really afraid of them. And really these, they're very beneficial for the garden. I mean, think about it. We're, this is the year of, we're getting two broods of cicadas this year. It is going to be deafening this summer um, with the males singing for the females. Um, we're probably going to have more cicada killers because they're going to have more food mm -hmm. for their babies. Uh, but they're wonderful pollinators and, um, you know, there's nothing to be afraid of. They're not, you know, going to come attack you. The only way a female cicada killer would sting you is if, you know, you handled her or you were, um, you know, stepped on her or were right on top of her. Um, it just, you know, that would be the only way that she would defend herself because she's not out for your blood. She wants a cicada. Nice. And then I have, like I said, I have an aspirator. This is the way kids can make an aspirator. You know, the, the point is, is they're using the suction from one straw to suck in the bugs. It works really well. I love sucking up bugs. Um, it, and um, looking at them because, you know, when they're flying around, it's kind of hard to identify them. But, uh, you know, let them suck up some bugs and then let them look at them for a while and then release them. Mm -hmm. Unless they're an aphid, then you can kill them. <laughs> okay. Very cool. I love making those little aspirators too, kids' activities. That's super fun. Yeah, my first experience with an aspirator was sucking up beneficial insects in the greenhouse. I and remember. taking them from room to room. So, uh, yeah. Um, like the like the idea of uh, sucking up bugs. <laughs> it was a fun activity, wasn't it, Candace? I, honestly, I did enjoy it. Yes, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we had one question about what you were talking about. Um, David asked, "You raise um, those caterpillars in a tank. What kind of setup do you need for that? So, if you did want to raise, let's say, monarch caterpillars." Okay, well, yeah, so you just need to identify the caterpillar because you need to make sure that you're providing fresh food. Now, this can be, this This is this live insect project is a little bit more complicated, but you know, just, you know, your little, your little butterfly cages, these, you know, these things that are on, you know, any kind of kid nature-y activity store, mm -hmm. you're gonna find these, that way you can look at them and they have everything they need. So with those, Poly, with those polythemus moss, I just had to, uh, you know, provide them leaves of swamp white oak. You know, if I were to bring in a monarch caterpillar, I would make sure that I wanted to have plenty of sources of milkweed and, you know, whatever they eat. You know, that is the most intense part. I think that is more intense than catching flies on my front porch, um, making sure that I have the, uh, you know, fresh, food for the uh, caterpillars, but it can be a really rewarding experience. Um, with that particular polythemus moth experiment, I noticed that all the males hatched before the females. And, um, you know, why, why did that happen? So just in, na in nature, I found out that insects, that happens a lot with insects. The males come out first because they're competing for love. <laughs> Females don't have to compete. Interesting. So I'll, I'll definitely uh, second what Kelly said about finding your food supply. And, and my family's done a lot of monarch rearing the last uh, four or five years. Um, and man, it really makes you realize how in short supply milkweeds are when you can't find one in any of the ditches. Around, you know, we live in a rural area and they're they're hard to find and, and keep at times all the caterpillars we have supplied with that. So that's a big challenge in, in raising at least monarch caterpillars and probably mm -hmm many others eat a lot. You'll be surprised at how much they eat. Um, as far as what, what kind of cage you put them in, um, we've had pretty good luck just on the table in our screened in porch raising them because our screened in porch is predator free. You know, the screen of the whole porch area kind of keeps them out. Uh, we found that they love to put their, um, when they go into the chrysalis, they love to hang down off the table edge and that looks super cool. The kids love to watch it hang in there. Um, cool. And they're just kind of, you know, as they start to come out, you can just kind of open the porch door and let them out. But the main thing you just want is, you know, protection from predators. Because if you had them just sitting out on your porch, just like other predators can get them in other places, you know, you're kind of setting them up. So 
Uh, we've since went to a little house like you had, Kelly, the little screened in house, which works just wonderfully too. And uh, it's kind of nice because it does give some separation between the little kids and the caterpillars where we just had, basically my wife just had a vase with milkweed stock sticking out of it and caterpillars on our porch. Um, that was sometimes for little ones, that's a little too close for being able to just reach up and grab a caterpillar or knock a milkweed stock over. So, mm -hmm. so sometimes they need to be protected from kids too, I guess, in the, in the midst of it all, but uh, super fun. And just kids learn a ton watching that development happen. And I mean, even for me as an adult, it is just mind blowing how that caterpillar goes into a chrysalis and comes out as something totally different. I mean, it's just hard to I even come I love watching them, especially monarchs. It's just, it's so cool. Yeah. I, I mean, I've seen it happen. I, I, I've been astounded. Uh, I used to do painted ladies a lot and I've had like a caterpillar in it, upside down and passing it around the room. And by the time it got to the other end of the room, it was a chrysalis. Mm -hmm. It had that, that the skin was still around uh, at the top, but it's just amazing how fast yeah. it came. Now imagine trying to find swamp milkweed for your polyphemus <laughs> moss, Ryan. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, actually, I, I had a beautiful, huge swamp milkweed last year that didn't come up this year. So last year I had a giant one. I don't know what happened to it. Um, it didn't come back in that same spot. So I, I heard that even though last year we didn't have that uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to butcher. What's that vortex we have? Polar vortex. Polar, polar vortex. Even though last year we didn't have the polar vortex and we had mild winters, we're, it's still wreaking havoc on the plants. The plants still didn't make it through last year because they were so stressed out from the polar vortex. Mm. And that's why some of us are struggling with, you know, the, I know I had a perennial right there last year. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know if that's what the conclusion is going to be, but uh, I've read a few articles about that. Yeah, I had a couple things come back this year Did that didn't come back this year, too, and I'm like, how is that even possible? This was the mildest winter, and yeah, so that's interesting. Okay, well, if you're... Swamp white oak. Oh, yeah. Oh, Love that tree. <laughs> okay, if you're just joining us, we've been talking about gardening with kids and kids' activities of things you can do to get kids in gardening and every nature. Um, and we're still taking gardening questions, of course, in between those. So if you have questions, add them to the comment box. I'm going to go back. I think we have uh, one or two questions. And then and Ryan has some activities to talk about, too. So let's see. Um, oh, Kathy had a comment earlier. She said her spider work is well-behaved. So it must kind of be the spot that she has it in. So that's great. That's a good spider wart. Uh, and then David asks, um, I have one strawberry plant out of seven that's not bearing any fruit. They're all in the same place. Any ideas on what it can, what I can do is this common. So one out of seven plants is not bearing any fruit. I mean, in my experience, drainage is a big affects strawberries quite a bit, at least in my garden and places I've planted it. So I don't know if maybe that's the end of the row and there's a little poor drainage right there or just a tiny difference in soil. I don't know, but I guess we're kind yeah. of assuming light's the same throughout. So. Yeah, I'd be curious to know that too, if the conditions are, if it's what the planting pattern is, if the conditions are any different. Or maybe different strawberry plants. Maybe you didn't get all the same kind. I don't yeah, it's possible it was mislabeled as a different variety, possibly. Yeah, could be a lot of things. Yeah, I would say if it if it continues next season, then you might take that one out and replant with replant with another one. Good question. Okay. Yeah, good. I I think we're caught up on questions. So Ryan, do you want to kind of sure. show what kind of kids gardening stuff you've been up to? Sure. Let me work on my screen share here. Um, let's see. And feel free to add questions to the comments at any time. And we'll get to them today, everybody. There we go. 
Okay, should be seeing some kids standing around uh, some flowers looking for insects. So um, this is uh, a couple of my kids and a couple of their cousins with their grandma doing um, actually a survey, a citizen science project that grandma's involved in, uh, where she's supposed to record whether what type of pollinator is on what plant. So they needed to identify whether it was a bee, a wasp, a fly, a beetle, what kind of pollinator it was. And, um, you know, this was meant to be something to kind of entertain the kids and for grandma to complete her project, but turned out to be uh, pretty dang entertaining for these guys. They were really into <laughs> what kind of insect they see and uh, and trying to identify those. And like today, they're still talking about, this was yesterday, they did this with grandma. They're still talking about that one beetle they couldn't identify. And what kind of beetle was that? And they wanted to catch another one today. So, uh, so it was real interesting for them. Um, you know, here's a, here's what my son Rowan with actually a little insect right on his hand there. He's trying to identify that little fly or uh, bee. And then the, the data sheet to the right. So they were kind of interested in the recording of data and writing things down. So um, just anything like Kelly has kind of went through some of the basics of insect ID and insect body parts and things. But man, kids really love that. And it, it can be a hit, especially if you get out in the field and, and get in the garden with them, uh, checking that stuff out. So uh, the other thing I was going to talk about was kind of a plant-related project we worked on. And so this was also with Grandma the same day. Um, and these guys, what they did in this uh, little activity was collected leaves. So we tried to get them to collect different shapes of leaves. Uh, so we had, I think you can see sycamore on the right there with all the kids standing under it. I think that's red oak um, on the left. Uh, we had a white oak, we had a sugar maple. So, you know, good variety of leaves. The kids went out and collected them. We looked at them, talked about them in the field. And then when we came in, the activity was to trace those leaves. So you can see these guys kind of tracing and then they were gonna cut them out. So, um, so Rose down in the corner there, she's already starting to cut out her first leaves she traced where uh, Rowan on the right there, he wanted to actually add the veins and things and thought that that was like a little more interesting than cutting it out was to add some of that detail. So uh, kind of went with the flow with that. Um, but kids, the kids enjoyed this. We did figure out that um, it helps to put a lot of the leaves upside down. If you can tell on the right there, Rowan has that sugar maple leaf upside down. So it kind of sits in the paper a little better. And Henry was tracing his uh, big giant sycamore leaf that he could barely fit on the page upside down. So, uh, so it's a great activity to get them interactive, interacting with nature, um, just like a lot of the things they do at school. You know, they they're cutting things out, they're using those fine motor skills to kind of, you know, develop that and relate that to nature. And we tried to select some different leaves that had different, you know, rounded versus pointy lobes. So, you know, we could look at white oak versus red oak. And the kids, I I would hope today now they would still be able to remember the difference between at least white oak and red oak. So, you know, with, with kids, it's not, not necessarily the same as adults where they're super interested in getting down to species and that name and, and all those specifics. But uh, just remembering those kind of broad categories, compound versus simple leaves. We, we looked at some compound leaves and chose the simple leaves to draw because they're easier. So uh, hopefully they got just some of those basics. But um, yeah, so that was kind of our our little leaf tracing project, but a great one, really simple to do with kids. We probably all have the, you don't have to use construction paper, just paper, a pencil, some scissors, and some trees around your yard. And then we're also going to talk about Kelly. Um, here, I'll stop, kind of stop sharing my screen here. Um, we're also going to talk about if, if as parents, if you don't know what a tree is, how can you figure that out? You know, it's because, because that, you know, I, we were lucky, uh, both grandma's a master gardener and I'm a forester. So, you know, we kind of had a leg up on tree ID, but one of those great apps for that is iNaturalist. And Kelly, you have a little more experience with that than me. You want to describe that a little bit to folks or how they might do that? I'm, I'm, I'm surprised I have a job anymore now that iNaturalist is out because um, iNaturalist is this wonderful app where you can go up to a leaf or you can go up to pretty much anything. I mean, I've identified voles that by their uh they're patterned in the lawn through iNaturalist and you take a picture of the leaf and it's going to give you some ideas right away it's going to give you you know the top six things that it thinks it is and then before you know it somebody like Ryan has gone on to the app and identified it uh as whatever it is a red maple um a white oak 
And so it's just really cool to, you know, it's a really cool app to have on your phone. Just download it on your phone, snap things, and it tells you what it is. Amazing. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, you kind of crowdsource your answer in a way. And, you know, by, by putting it out there for the rest of the community on iNaturalist, and yeah, usually somebody replies pretty quickly. And the, the even better part about this app is all this information that is collected because it's going to ask you location is then used by scientists to um, understand um, things about the natural areas and, you know, species. Um, so even better, you're contributing to science, but they're helping you out by giving you the ID. That's really cool. I haven't played around with that much yet. I'm going to have to try it out. Oh, it is amazing. You you will not use anything else. Very cool. And it's, yeah. I mean, you know, we're pretty good at identification. I mean, I know there's times when we get stumped every now and then. You're going to pull that out. You're going to be like, I naturalist. Somebody help me. <laughs> well, and that, as you were saying that, that made me think about mentioning our uh, Facebook group, too, that we've uh, started. Well, it's probably been about a month or so now that we've had it running. We have an extension horticulture group where we're kind of doing something similar a little bit where people can ask questions in there. They can post photos. And what's interesting is that, yeah, a lot of it is being crowdsourced. A lot of the other members in the group are identifying things and answering questions. And, and that's really cool. So I'm sure we can get a, a link to that. Uh, in the comments if anybody wants to check it out. Yeah, I, I've been super impressed with all the stuff that's been shared amongst the group. I mean, I've a lot, I've shared a lot. I mean, it's, oh man, I, I can't, I'm amazed at how quickly an answer comes in. The correct yeah. answer. And yeah, the yeah, they're doing great. I'm, I'm surprised um, we don't have more people like that want to be part of the group. <laughs> I mean, this is like the most popular group on Facebook, people. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got uh, I thought the pollinator week content was really good this past week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ken and Chris had some great stuff in there for pollinator yeah. week. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Janet had a question, or not a question, a comment while you were talking, Ryan. She said, another fun thing to do with leaves is to put the leaf under the paper and color over the top and oh. see the pattern of the veins. I've done that before too. Yeah, we should have done that. That would <laughs> stuff out. We could have done that too. I Next time. Thank you, Jen. Next time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, if you have gardening questions, add them to the comments there. We are kind of talking about gardening with kids today and just answering any kind of questions you have about what's going on in your uh, garden. But I think we're caught up on questions. So should we talk about um, fairy gardens next, maybe? Yeah. Okay. So, I'm going to reposition my uh, oops, my camera here. Let's see how this will work so I can scoot back a little bit. Um, but I went, to, ran to the garden center and um, just grabbed a couple of simple things just to show you how simple and easy a, a fairy garden can be. So if you've never heard of the, the concept of a fairy garden, essentially... Um, you can do it a lot of ways. You can take kind of all natural materials. So if, you, if you're working with kids outdoors, let's say in a wooded setting, this is really fun just to gather natural materials, pine cones, leaves, sticks, whatever is, is available nature-wise. And you can create a fairy garden next to a tree, at the base of a tree, and you can kind of use all natural materials. Um, or what a lot of people will do too is they'll create more of kind of an indoor or container kind of fairy garden where you're adding in some actual kind of props and smaller plants and things like that. You can tell stories along with it. There's a lot of great kids uh, books that can go along with kind of fairy gardens. But the idea is that you have some type of, of fairy in there or <laughs> different different props to make it kind of cute and cute and fun. So um, I'm just going to do a just a quick uh, fairy garden in a container um, like this. Um, I love this this style of container. I use this a lot for like cacti and succulents because it's kind of shallow. So this is one of my favorites favorite containers. Um, but it's nice for for a fairy garden because you have a lot of flat surface area. Um, that's kind of what you want. You more of kind of a, want a wider pot so that you have more room for rocks and moss and plants and, and um, props and stuff. So that's what I'm going to be using today. Um, and you can really can use just about any type of, of plant. 
uh, in there. It just depends where you're going to put that fairy garden. So I was at the garden center and just grabbed a couple of tropical, uh, more kind of house plant style plants. So I've got a little uh, croton here. That's This is going to be kind of my vertical kind of tree looking uh, plant in the fairy garden. I've got a uh, pothos variegated pothos it's going to be kind of my ground cover kind of trailing over the edge and then I also thought this little arrowhead uh, plant was cute too it's just another kind of tree uh, height in there so as long as they have similar light requirements for where you're going to put your fairy garden you can you can pick whatever you want in terms of of, of plants so I tend to place the plants first. So I tend to kind of just space them out amongst my pot and get them where I where I want them and then go ahead and plant those in there. So let me angle this down a little bit. There we go. So I'm gonna go ahead and place kind of my croton, which will be my tree towards the back of my uh, planter here. Tuck that down in. My arrowhead plant will be kind of my other tree kind of shape in there. And then I'm gonna have the pothos kind of on the other edge. So it can kind of trail over and be kind of my, my ground cover. So I'm essentially kind of creating kind of this wooded kind of forested feel with the plant placement in there. Okay, and you're typically gonna select uh, plants from like the, a lot of garden centers now have a terrarium section or a fairy garden section. And that's typically where you're gonna find kind of small potted plants, like, like things like this, okay? So once you have your plants in, then you can go crazy with the props and the accessories. So I'm gonna use, I think some rocks to form kind of a pathway through my fairy garden. So I can start kind of at the front with my ground cover and kind of use those rocks. And this again, you can collect from outside, color, different color rocks, kind of create a pathway running through my garden here. And that pathway is gonna lead to a cute little garden gate, which again, you can get lots of fun props in the fairy garden sections. So I'm gonna put that kind of towards the back of my way. And then you can use different kinds of mosses. This is a uh, colored reindeer moss. It's a bright green. You can place that around the plants to create kind of that carpet moss. There's a lot of fun mosses you can use. And you can also collect moss from shady spots as well. Go with completely all natural ingredients. And if you're on a budget too, that's a great way to do it too, with natural. So then I'm just going to kind of fill in with the moss around my pathway there. And then you can finish, you can keep adding props and keep adding fun stuff. And then you can finish off with your fairy wherever you're going to put her in there. So just super simple, some couple plants, some moss, some pebbles, and then whatever kind of props you want to uh, add in there. And you have yourself a cute little fairy garden. Pretty basic. So that's that's kind of nice too, Candice. Are, those are all pretty common house plants, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So as, as far as where you put it, you know, that could stick around for a long time as a little house plant arrangement too. Yeah, exactly. So I think what I'll do is I'll probably put this outside kind of on my porch where it gets kind of filtered um, sunlight. It's not going to be in direct sun and I'll, I'll keep it outside for the summer. And then once the temperatures cool down, I'll bring it inside and keep it as a house plant. Yeah. Definitely. So and so when, when you're working with the kids, you just spread those materials, different materials out in front of them. And uh, you would be surprised at how different these arrangements look mm -hmm. with all the same materials. Yeah, that's the fun. That's the fun thing is you let them get creative and they put their own spin on it. Yeah. And then that's fun. their garden. Mm -hmm. They water it. They take yep. care of it. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and the big thing is like all the little props and stuff. That's what the kids go That's nuts fun. And, you know, because it's a fairy garden, everything has to be little teeny tiny, little houses, little, all these small little props that, I mean, kids just, at least my kids, they absolutely love, like, the smallest, dinkiest, easy, most easy to lose toy they can find. They love uh -huh. that stuff in a fairy garden. They love it. And, and you know, don't don't be afraid to use a Star Wars guy from time to time instead of fairy. Oh, yeah, for sure. We've done things like that, too, where um, other sure. props, too. Yeah, I've used a lot of like little toy dinosaurs from the dollar section, mm -hmm. insects, stuff like that. Yeah, definitely. And I think, Ryan, you had, I think, some photos of some fairy gardens your kids yeah. are into. I had some photos to share, and um, only one of these did I actually plant. Um, <laughs> thank you, Grandma, for, you know, pulling her sisters and getting pictures from multiple fairy gardens over the years. Um, I, I hate to say that uh, I don't know where all the pictures of our fairy gardens have went, but I couldn't find a whole lot of the ones that we, other than this one that we actually did at grandma's house. Um, I guess you guys are seeing this is my yep. answer. Yep. Yeah. Um, so this was um, like Candace talked about a nice shallow flat, lots of surface area type of type of setting out of this old wheelbarrow that, you know, grandma had kind of retired and she wanted a fairy garden in. So I kind of helped these guys get started. I guess I don't have the finished product picture. We had a little house. We have a little fairy there. There's a little bridge off to the right. And those are just annual flowers we just got at the garden section, gardening section. You know, nothing special, just annuals that'll be in that for the year. And um, that's like kind of a one season fairy garden. But, um, you know, here's some other ones kind of like Candace's that are, you know, in a pot with some nice little, Again, the, the little tiny, you know, accent items are, are what all the kids go for, but popular with adults too. <laughs> um, yep. Another one with a nice little uh, bridge. This is, again, one of uh, my mother-in-law's sisters uh, put these together. So thanks to them for, for sharing these. But another really pretty one, and this is kind of a whole little set right here that they made with, uh, with kids to put outside then. So this one you can see is in a different type of container, a basket. So that's kind of, you can use just about anything in this that's going to have enough drainage. Again, we don't want to have something with no drain holes in the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, another kind of picture of the basket with some of that, tra the succulents trailing off of it. Looks pretty yeah. neat. Uh, this is an old colander, which, you know, when you talk about good drainage, man, mm -hmm. better drainage than that. Um, yeah. On the, same, on the same note, might dry out kind of fast too. But, uh, you know, you can see another little arrangement with some succulents and, um little houses and things to go with it. Uh, I really like this pot, just as kind of raw concrete to it, but um, another one here with succulents. And then these were all made to actually sit outside. So here's where they finally landed outside near the uh, blooming rhododendron in a shade garden is where these went. So, yeah. Um, so, you know, these can be taken in and out then kind of like Candace talked about. So they could be taken in during the cold part of the year, save for next year. Um, or, you know, in our case, at, at my house, we've done a lot with annuals that we've liked to just kind of redo each year. So each mm -hmm. year differently. And uh, here's one with a few more of the colored rocks. And, you know, you can see some of the reindeer moss in there and some other little things that, um, you know, look really nice when you put it all together, um, add a lot of detail. Not Actually, not a ton of plants in this one compared to all the other stuff. So mm -hmm. I have to have a ton of plants. Um, and here's just an example of one, and maybe I have two here that are truly just completely outside. So this is a, the locust tree you can see there. Uh, just some little plants uh, plunked in there, the little fairy on the left, um, little bench for the fairy to sit on if she wants to. So um, they, it can be entirely outdoors year round as well. You don't have to have these as indoors or in pots necessarily. Love so it. yeah, pretty versatile activity to do with kids. Um, and, and pretty popular. You have to buy things um, either, uh, you know, uh, like uh, Candace said, go to the go to the dollar store. Um, you can paint rocks. You can get little pine cones and little pieces of bark that really make it look cool. Or you can let the kids get creative and use some of their toys. Or um, or later this summer, the locust exoskeletons would be up. <laughs> Uh, there you go. Bling. There you go. That would work. 
Yeah, we've added just a lot of toys and things we had too that were just mm -hmm. something the boys wanted to throw in there. So, mm -hmm. yeah, Gail says they're gonna have to try a dino garden. I think the dinosaurs are super cute. I love using those. <laughs> dino garden. I know garden. Jurassic Park style. Yeah. Let's, let's <laughs> forget fairy gardens. Dino yeah. garden. Ooh. Who needs the fairies? <laughs> that might be the new thing, Candy. Yeah. <laughs> Might have started a national trend here. Where yeah, where I could see some little toy cars in there too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, awesome. Well, I think we had some great ideas for kids gardening stuff today. So hopefully that gives people some inspiration of things they can try at home. Very simple, inexpensive gardening project. And I think the key is just to get them engaged in gardening however you can, whether it's through the insects or the plants or the fairies or whatever it might be. If there's any way to get them involved, it's, I think it's all, it's all great for sure. You know, one thing we didn't talk about today, but we covered earlier this spring, we talked about like a kid's seed germination project. And mm -hmm. I found that, you know, I start uh, vegetable seeds a lot in the spring and my kids really like to watch that, you know, watch them grow and watch them develop. I can't say they do all the watering, you know, I definitely, <laughs> keep after them for that if you really want the plants to truly thrive. But uh, but that's a really, you know, interesting learning experience. A lot like, you know, caterpillar emerging as a moth. You know, you start with this tiny little seed and boy, it turns into this plant that later they're picking tomatoes off of. And so to make that, you know, connect all that stuff together for a kid is really pretty interesting and fun for them, I think. So mm -hmm. it's another it great one. One purposeful activity, meaning one activity that I may go and do with, a ch with the children, they see me again, they still remember the insects, they want to show me the insects they found in the garden. So one purposeful activity kind of leads to, you know, them to explore more in nature. And we know that we need that, especially right now, the kids need something cool and fun to do. And so... Now, um, probably Ryan's kids might actually want to know what kind of tree that is. Mm -hmm. Ryan's going to be like, <gasps> he's going to tell them anyway. The, the day they do. Oh, <laughs> no, I mean, so far they've, they've remembered some for a while, but we have not ingrained many of the native species yet. Uh, but <laughs> they're learning. Your phone. I naturalist. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've been surprised. My youngest, Rowan, is pretty, he's pretty interested in nature and things. And he sees me, as, as you guys probably do all the time, taking tons of pictures of plants. <laughs> you know, we're on a hike and I'm lagging behind the whole group because I'm taking a picture of a certain plant. And so he's kind of picked up on that and he likes to do that now too. So when we go out, like I let Rowan take his little pictures too of what plants he wants to. So, um, well, I, I do get a little nervous with my children having my phone for too long, you know, uh, losing it, dropping it in the weeds or something else. <laughs> thing to see that, you know, they, they can make, I think for this next generation, it's going to be important to have some of that connection of technology to nature and how you kind of bridge that and build that interest and work them both together. So um, anyway, so that, that's been interesting. I never would have thought that he would have gotten, uh, you know, interested in plant photography. I think that's the nerdiest thing that we all do probably but. that's cool though asher mimics me he uh waters plants anytime he can he wants to pick up the uh watering can and water plants and then he tries to catch bugs on the front screen board screened in <laughs> sometimes he kills them <laughs> yeah <Your> mommy it's <laughs> Teaching them early. <laughs> Love it. Okay, we're down to less than 10 minutes. So if you have gardening, any lingering questions, feel free to add them to the comments. Um, Gail had a question here. Um, can I use something like stone crop sedum in a pot and then plant it in the ground in the fall? Yeah, absolutely. I use a lot of perennial, different perennials in my container pots. And then I try to get them into the ground by like, early September so they have enough time to kind of get some roots going but um, yeah absolutely Gail I would and okay. you know maybe mulch them a little extra yeah make sure they're watered yeah. Water good. and and honestly see them so tough it would be fine probably either way but <laughs> yeah okay keep those, questions, keep those questions coming but while we wait for questions any 
Anything else you guys want to add about kids gardening or anything you want to share about what you're doing in your gardens right now? Um, one of the things uh, that I've known and, you know, uh, e even though we, we, in my unit, we have just hired a, we didn't just hire, but we now have a horticulture educator who specializes in youth that kind of took some of that work off my plate. Um, uh, one of the things that I have noticed um, too is um, that the, the, uh, there are a lot of really cool online resources. Um, I don't want to say names of businesses, but, you know, there was just like where you can make insects, where you can, you know, put together these little nature projects. And even though, uh, you know, it is all about nature and <laughs> you don't want to like buy things, but, you know, it's been a really good resource for us actually in our jobs. Um, those Sorry. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah. you know, uh, if I, Maribel, you guys saw Maribel. Um, Maribel has been, is my seven-year-old niece who is the light of my life. Mm -hmm. um, I can get her to, if I, she loves planting potatoes and then, you know, harvesting, she'll eat peas, you know, so the more you can, I'm sure Ryan can uh, account to this a little bit more, you know, the more, he takes them out there. I mean, clearly they're not going to stay out there for two hours with them gardening, but he takes them out there, does a little small tasks. They're more interested. Yeah, it's, I, I've definitely found it's, man, it's really hard to keep them engaged out there in a work production setting. You know, you're, you're not going to go out and get the whole place weeded in an hour and have help from them that helps, but you know, that, that contributes to the workload necessarily, but it's just, Having those um, positive interactions out there, and if it's just a five minutes of weeding is all they do, I, I've got usually have a section somewhere where they can just dig a hole if they want to, <laughs> or or whatever. You know, sometimes my kids are more into just having car carrying their little tools out there and just using each tool for something than they are necessarily the gardening task I have at hand to do. So uh, definitely, that's probably been my biggest mistake in the past is trying to have my garden work time coincide with my kid interaction time. It's like, really, you need to go out there with the intent purpose of like the, the gardening being entertainment for the kids and not seeming like work yet. You know, maybe as they get bigger and they can have some chore responsibilities, it could be a, a work requirement kind of thing. But yeah, that's, that's what I think the biggest thing is just making it fun for them, keeping it simple. Yeah. Kelly planting potatoes. That's something that Rowan really loved this spring. Just, I had the trench already or the little, you know, planting row already opened up for him and he could just go along and plunk them in. And, you know, if they're not exactly six or eight inches, oh, well, you know, still grow. But, um, you know, one of the things that I tried with the Cubs, our Cub Scout group earlier this year was starting seeds and, you know, a flat with like 49, 48 cells or whatever's in a flat. And, you know, I had got like they had fun putting the soil in it and everything, but man, when it came down to putting those little tomato seeds in each cell, I had really underestimated the ability of you know, <laughs> me to keep all the kindergartners in that group on track for to get one seed in each cell. So I we had some cells with two, we had some that didn't have a seed, um, but that's fine. You know, I also started another tray that I did myself later, just so we'd have for sure something that kind of grew. And uh, but yeah, just. I think in the past I've just had um, way too high of expectations for what you can accomplish in one gardening session or in one little activity. Keep it simple. Kids don't need a lot to stay entertained. They they had more fun playing with the tomato seeds than they did actually putting them in the soil the night we did that. So, nice. Ryan, I have a secret for you. Chocolate cupcake for the longest root. Five minutes, longest route, you'll get a chocolate cupcake. Mm. Works every time. That's mm -hmm. that's a good reward. So that's for a weed they pull. A root for the longest route. Yep, oh. for a weed they pull. Nice. <laughs> that's a good. That's a good incentive. To yeah, yeah. Rooted yeah. weed. You can't just yeah. pull the weed. You got to get the roots. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's good. That's, that's good. good. Okay, well, we got two. I'm going to finish this off. We got two great comments um, here. Janet said. Um, her daughters uh, studied about and planted a garden for the first time ever. 
And it's been a great project with her four-year-old son. She said he's learned so much and he's eaten the vegetables. So that's a good, good testament. Uh, and Gail had a comment about maybe teaching some basic color theory with mosaic garden stones and then the learning colors to complement the flowers. That's a good color. That's good very good. Awesome. Well, thank you all for um, hopping on today to uh, learn about some kids gardening activities and ask us some great questions. We appreciate it as always. Um, our next show is going to be on July 15th. So in about two weeks, we'll be back on. And we're going to have another guest uh, horticulturist with us that time. We're going to have Ken Johnson, our fellow horticulture educator, is going to talk about vegetable garden pests. So now is that time of summer when the pests start showing up on those vegetables. So we're going to talk specifically about that and then answer any of your gardening questions as usual. And like we mentioned, if you have a gardening question that comes up in between these shows, you're welcome to join our uh, horticulture group over on Facebook. Uh, and you can ask questions there and that link's in the comments. So thank you everybody for hopping on today. Have a great rest of the day and enjoy getting out there in the garden. We'll talk to you next time. <laughs>